for giving us to be in his presence, in his presence, to worship him, to glorify his name, to magnify his name. Before we begin, to begin with our program, in the last name for what a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before you to stop with this program for tonight, we're asking for your holy presence to be with us. Forgive us our sins, take control of the program for us. May everything that is going to be done here tonight or be undone and under the control of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray, amen. To begin with our program, let us open our hymn note on num number 26. We praise thee, O God. As you know, the title for, the, for this week is Preparation for the Final Crisis Part 2. And as we are living in a time for Christ, that is really telling us that Christ is, Christ is coming his name. So it's time for us to prepare. And we've been living in preparation time. So now it's time for us to complete this preparation to be ready for him. Number 26, we praise thee, O God. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died in his Magona above. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. We rise once again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of life, who has shown us a Savior, who is given all night. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. We rise us again. Our glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May his soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, God the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, God the glory. Revive us again. Let's sing our second theme song, number 417. Would you be free? Would you be free from your burden of sin? This power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you, O oh, evil, oh, a victory win? This wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? This power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleanse and to cover his tide. This wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the lame. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the lame. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? This power in the blood, power in the blood. Since things are lost and it's life given flow. This wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the name. There is power. 
fire. Wonder what you found in the precious land of the land. Would you do this for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Wonder working in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Yes, there is power in the blood of the Lamb. Let us read our memory, our text for the week, Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. And they, in it read, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Amen. Let us need for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, once more we come before that throne of grace, humbly bow down before that throne to honor you, to praise you, to glorify and magnify your name. With open heart, we are coming before you this evening to give unto you all the glory that is due unto your name and your name alone. With reverence and respect, we boldly bow down before our throne. With open hearts, with open faces, we come. We come just as we are, for we cannot change ourselves for the better. Because you say, come just as we are. The change that needs to be what in us can only be done by you. As we decided, as we make the decision to spend time with you, and those changes are happening. By your, by your love. Help us, Lord, to always love to come before that eternal grace. Help us to always love to approach you with open hearts and to not leave, to not hide anything from you, for nothing is hidden from you. And help us to never have any secrets when it comes to you and us. May the relationship that you have, that we have with you, develop continuously. May our relationship with you grow grow. May your love, may our love for you also go up, Father. We thank you for this opportunity yet given to us to come before thy throne. We thank you, Lord, for the breath of life that you preserve in us. But there are many who woke up this morning and, Father, did not get to see this time that we are in right now. We bless and glorify your name for this privilege and opportunity. Forgive us, Lord, for every sin that we have, we have committed cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we look back farther throughout the day, we could see clearly that we did certain things that were not in harmony with your will, with your word. So that's why we humbly bow down, asking you for forgiveness, asking you for strength and power, so that those temptations comes again in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by the power of his word for us to say it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Father, as we are uniting one more time in your presence and, and, and another night, and this 40 that is almost ended, we're asking for this, please, Lord. We pray ourselves, prepare us, Lord, in character for us to continue to seek for you, for us to love you, for us to appreciate you, and for us to reflect the lovely image of Christ. Help us to that the times that we are spending, we have been spending with you since the day one of, of this 40, let them not be time wasted. But times, Father, that we cherish, time that we gain experience, we gain knowledge, and we gain, we gain wisdom from you. Help us, Lord, to not forget anything, that, everything that we have learned from you from this folly. Help us to always remember that the time that we are living in, it is high time. 
It's time for us to consecrate our lives to you. And it's time for us to, to dedicate all to you, to surrender all to you, Father. Help us to surrender ourselves to you daily. And help us to live out the life of Christ. And help us to live out Christ in us. Cleanse, purify, sanctify us. We lift up our brethren before you, Lord, whom you have been using to bring the word of life unto us. We're asking for his best each and every single one of them and their families and us who are here listening to these words, Father, from day one. Help us so that we are very beneficial from what we've even heard before and help us to apply each and every single thing, uh, the words, the message in our lives. And help us to share with them other people. May your love for me, our love for so increase. May we please find in heaven. Give us a hunger and thirsting for, 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 for other souls to bring them to the fore. May your love, Father in heaven, entice us to bring us, Father, to repentance and for us to go out into your will. Bless us of the program for us. May everything that we do from now on, going forward, all the night according to your will and under the guidance and the influence of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Once again, brethren, we praise the Lord. We thank him for his love and mercy. And we thank him for this holy that he has put on in place for us. To, before we enter into our season of prayer, let us take a few songs before we enter. And let us thank number 333, 339, and 174. 333. Have thy own will, Lord. Have thy own will. Thou art the Father, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting. Yield and spare. Have thy own will, Lord. Have thy own will. Search me and try me, Master, today. Why the day snow, Lord? Watch me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thy own will, Lord, have thy own will. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power on power. Surely is thine. Touch me and leave me, Savior divine. Have thy own way, Lord. Have thy own way. All of my being, I so lose way. Fear with the spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Amen. Let us sing now our next song on number 239. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence. Daily, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. 
unto Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow worthy pleasures are forsaken take me Jesus take me now I surrender I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Instead of saying in room 74, let us go directly to our season of prayer. We are going to pray. We are going to ask God to help us to surrender all to him and also to help us to forsake every nonsense and iniquities of our lives and for him to give us victory over every defects of character. And next, we're going to pray as usual for our brother in Ukraine and Russia. And as you see, this one is really intensifying and, and people are still dying. More destruction ahead, um, is happening. We're going to ask God to take control. He is in control, we know, we have no doubt. We're going to ask him to protect lives, to save lives, so that those who have not yet known Christ may come to understand who Jesus is and accept them as they receive the gospel. Let us pray. Well, we have, we have two prayer. I'm doing one. We need a volunteer for a second one. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we come before that throne of grace to give it all to you, to surrender all to you. Father, as you know, it is really hard sometimes for us to surrender all to you. That's exactly right, Father. We are two in gospel workers. And, and, and for us to 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 say take our hearts for we cannot give it for it is yours for you to mold us to shape us it is because father sometimes we find it hard to surrender all to you so that's why we come this evening lord to ask you to please take our heart take it for it is yours for we cannot give it take us father shape us mold us into your likeness and help us to be like you we come to surrender all to you this evening. We come to ask you for deliverance, Father, over the iniquities of our lives. We come to ask you for victory over every defects of our characters. Father, many of us, if not all, we all need to change something in our characters. 
because the problem that we have is a character problem. And because of sin, Lord, our character is not what it, where it should be, what it should be. Our character should be like Christ's character. But because of sin, because of the things of this world, Father, sometimes that we give ourselves, we give ourselves unto, we are not able to reflect the lovely image of Christ as quickly as we should. So tonight, Father, we come to surrender all to you, all our defects of character, all our iniquities, all our sins. We come to give it all to you, surrender all to you. We're asking for his peace to take over them. Cleanse us, Father in heaven, make us whole again. We were whole at one time. Before sin, we were whole, Father. When sin came, when sin came, Father, we're not whole anymore. We are breaking pieces. We are grasshoppers. In the morning, we, we, we shine. And at night, we fade away. And we need to sleep to recover. We need your help, Father in heaven. All this because of sin. We should never be tired. We should never feel weary. We should never feel hunger. But because of sin, we feel all these things. Forgive us, Lord, for our sinfulness. Cleanse us all from our unrighteousness. Purify and sanctify us in the blood of the Lamb. May his character become our character. May his lifestyle become our lifestyle. Help us to reject everything of this world. And help us to put in Christ in his righteousness. Help us to, to put on the whole armor of God so that we may be able to withstand the, 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 the attack of the enemy. We know that he is always attacking us. And help us, Lord, to be filled with your word, to be filled with your knowledge and wisdom so that when he comes, Father, we may be able to find strength from above to overcome him in his temptation. Cleanse us, purify us, take control of our lives, take control of the program for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. One more prayer, brethren. Um, let us pray. Once more, our Lord, we stay at your feet and we want to pray for our total consecration, our total surrender, because we realize that without that complete surrender, we will never become the person that you expect from us. You want us to be holy. You want us to be perfect. But unless you control our life, we will not be able to make it as you want. May you dwell in us. May you reflect your, your glory in us so that we can just reflect in ourselves like the moon, reflect the light of the sun during the night. Help us to reflect your character in the dark of this world. We pray, Lord, so that you can shape us and make us the person you want us to be. And we know that tribulation, um, trials are just for that, in order to shape us, to purify us, so that we can eventually occupy the place that you have appointed unto us. We thank you, Lord, for many tribulations that we've been, we've been through, because they are there to shape, to form our character. May you help us to succeed, whatever the trial that, that is on our way, on our track. Help us to be positive, not to see the curse, not to see the problems, but to see the opportunities, the blessing that comes with. Because all trials means benefit, and with them, a lot of blessings are, are coming. But sometimes we are so blind, we cannot discern what is behind problems and difficulties. And, and for this reason as well, we pray you for our brethren in Russia and Ukraine. We know that this war that is going on, but we know all things work for the good of those that love God. That is why we pray so that you can strengthen, you can comfort, you can help our brethren to be nearer you than before. And because of this time of trouble, they can pray more, they can serve you in a better heart, and they can take full, they can be under the full control of the Holy Spirit, because now is now no longer the time to live for ourselves. It is time to live for you and for you alone. We need, Lord, that total surrender. We need that entire consecration because Christ will come and look for a people that resemble him, that reproduce his character on this earth. 
oh Lord, we know our situation is very sad because up to now we have multitude of defects to overcome and we see salvation is drawing nigh. Oh Lord, we feel tired of sin, we feel tired of defects. Help us to overcome, help us to win like Christ will run so that we can, as we defeat the enemy, we can become the kind of person that you want us to be and we can go out and walk victoriously, walk over the our foe and win soul exactly where he had taught to make a complete disaster. We know that you can change curse to blessings. You can save soul that seem to be lost because no case is, is not um, so bad that you cannot save. Because we know as a God, you are powerful to save whoever wants, whoever desires to be saved. You will stretch your hand and take that person out of the pit. Give him new courages, give him new determinations to start a new life and to even do things that nobody could imagine it was possible. Because with you, everything is possible. May the Lord you bless us and bless our brethren in Ukraine. May you take control of their hearts and help them to be to have peace in the midst of that turmoil and commotions, that agitation in their country. But give them peace, not the peace that the world is giving, but the world that God alone can give. Because your peace is a peace that puts us above the difficulties of this world. We can, we can support all problems and difficulties. Um, provided it is in the Lord's will. Because if it is in your will, we know that that problem will change to blessings and will, will be for our good. As you said, everything is ours, provided it is for our good. May your Lord, you bless us with all kinds of blessings and may you bless the rest of the program, not only tonight, but the days left before the program can be over. Please be with the one that will be speaking tonight and anoint them so that they can speak from you and say things that will be edifying your people. All these mercies we ask in Christ's precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Now we are taking one testimony before we go to our half nugget. We're asking if someone has a testimony. Now it's the, it's the time to share this testimony. All right, I personally thank God for something he's done for me. I remember last week around this time, I think it was last Tuesday or Wednesday, that um, my wife came to me while I was doing a program. She was not feeling well. And then we went to buy a um, blood pressure kit, a cough. And when we came back, took our vital signs, it was high. And that vital signs took our um, blood pressure, it was high. I mean, I was thinking about curiosity because I didn't think I had have a pressure and then when I took it, mine was higher than her. And 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 I was feeling a little bit, my neck was hurting, back pain, and had had, had issues. So I thought it was just like a day. And and I was not well ever since I've been taking natural medicine. And I've been taking the blood pressure has been high up, up and down, up and down. And then today when I went to my PCP and they took it again and it was perfect blood pressure, 120 over 60. So I thank God for it. And I realized that it was stress or is the enemy's attack that made that happen. I don't know whatever the cause is, but I thank God that this this um has come to its normal phase and that I'm not feeling the same way I felt last week. So I bless his name for that. That's my testimony. I hope it, it can help somebody. So now let us go to our nugget with our brother, Brother Jackson. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to thank the Lord once again to give us the opportunity to be here once again to go through this uh, moment of health. Actually, it's a good option because we need to, to see uh, to not only to our spiritual health, but also our physical health. Okay, I will be sharing the screen again. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll continue with what we were considering yesterday and, and stop. Um, 
and from where we left off. Let me share the screen again. Okay, so I will ask. Okay, thank you for the card. Let's see if this will be. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so we're considering football, uh, food, foodborne illnesses or diseases. So we don't get, um, we didn't get disease only from, you know, being in contact with someone who was infected, but we can get, uh, you know, infected by something that we eat. Actually, I have an experience here. Let me see if I have this experience. I'm not going to go through this, all this. There is an experience here that is a little sad experience. Not sure if I have this here. Give me just a moment. There is, oh, I can just tell you the experience. There is a case of a, of a mother. Actually, I had the picture of the mother and the son. It's a very sad thing that it happened here in the United States. And, and now the mom um, decided to get involved in you know, and, and searching and doing research and, and helping people so that they don't have to go through the same experience that, you know, she went through. It was um, an evening and the father and the mom, they went to, um, you know, they went to get some food and they went to get, to buy you know, burgers. Uh, the, the dad got, you know, a burger, and the mom got one as well. And they bought one for, for, their, for their son, who was a little boy. I think it was, he was about, about probably three years old, two or three years old. And they got home. And this is something that really, that happens very often here, um, especially for people who eat meat. Well, they got the, burger, the burgers and, and they went home and they ate all of, you know, uh, each one, you know, eating their burger, and now they went to bed. But during the night, you know, I'd say the, the next day, the, the 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 boy started feeling diarrhea and going to the bathroom nonstop, and something that was not common. And and they decided to take the boy to hospital. I think the, on the second or third day, they decided to take him to hospital because it was not normal. Well, unfortunately, the burger that they, you know, that they purchased, uh, that they bought, you know, the, the child's immune system, as you said, that we saw yesterday that some people are more susceptible to infection or being infected by viruses. And the child got infected with a virus that was, either a virus or bacteria, I would say, that was in the burger. So... Um, that's why even when it is, uh, it's vegetarian or vegan, if there's a place that I like to eat, it's, is, you know, it's at home. You know, sometimes I, I buy things from, you know, from vegetarian restaurant or something, but it's not, it's still not safe. Um, so, but it was not vegetarian. It, it was a not normal, bur you know, burger. And what happened is, whether it's whether it's burger, whether it's meat, whatever, there was a there's a time that the meat can actually produce bacteria, and what happens is there are some types of bacteria, they are able to resist certain temperature, so if you do not warm up the food the way you that at the the temperature that you're supposed to warm it up, then that bacteria will not be killed, all right. So th this is what happened at the rest, I mean, at the, the restaurant, they got that, that uh, burger, but it seems that the person that was, you know, preparing it did not warm it up properly, or there, is, there was some type of cross-contamination where it was next to something else that was contaminated and it passed to, into the food, you know, the burgers. And the boy was taken to the hospital in the, you know, the, his kidney was already in, you know, affected by it. And then he had a kidney failure. So 
they were giving him dialysis, you know, to get the kidneys to, you know, survive a little bit, but it was too late. Just by eating a burger. Can you imagine? You know, so, um, so that's why we really need to be careful with, you know, with our food and you know, take care of it. Um, in the past, for example, in the people, uh, in, in when the people of Israel was in the desert, so God always told them, you know, um, during the during the the days, they would He would give them food every day. Well, actually, this is a, this has a spiritual uh, le lesson to it as well. But um, but they would tell them, don't leave that for the, for the next day. Eat everything today, and whatever they would leave for the next day would go bad. All right, so. So now, uh, now it's different because we have refrigerators, but uh, we need to be uh, careful in you know, the way we handle our food. So there is um, actually some environment where the, vi where the virus, where I say mostly the bacteria, most of the time it's bacteria. They would actually grow, they'll grow. And, um, and for example, there's also at some restaurants, so sometimes I, there's a restaurant I, I went to, you know, one, one time, and I was a little, conf you know, worried. I saw, you know, the people who were there because they get training, but some of them were not following those things. You know, there's rules. The, you know, you, for example, you cannot, if you have an apron, for example, you, you know, you cover, you know, your, you know, uh, your body with it, especially if you're dressed, you cannot take this outside, you know, and I've seen many of them taking that outside, whether they go smoke outside or do something and they take that with them outside. Because the point is you can touch something or whatever that may happen, your hand may be contaminated. You touch that apron and then you, you know, you take that inside and it might pass that to the food, you know, whether you want it or not. But I'm glad that some places um, they were serving food with gloves on. And um, when the COVID came, I, I kind of, I was kind of um, happy in a sense because I could see people covering their, you know, their mouth while they were serving the food. You know, I said, I wish they would keep that even after COVID if it, you know, if it doesn't, because, you know, other people can get contaminated by just, you know, speaking and then they drop something in the food without even considering it. Um, so that's uh, what happens. There are some types of environment, so we saw this already. I'm not going to go through these. Now, one thing about this I didn't touch is this: when you have food in your hands, let's say you have um, you, the food was left over, um, and you don't, you're not sure what to do. If you're doubting, it's better not to eat it, right? So when you're in doubt, should I eat this or not? Then you are in a situation where you might be at risk of uh, of getting uh, infected by bacteria. So we're gonna see this. Um, there are conditions for the, for, for the bacteria to grow, to multiply. So, um, so they call this fat tom. Uh, so that's uh, it's food, acidity, time, temperature, oxygen, and moisture. So uh, the food itself, like I said the last time, the, the food itself can produce bacteria after a certain amount of time, then that's why, you, you know, it can, most of the time it's, it's uh, food that have protein in it, but um, like the, the seafood or dairy products, they are mostly, you know, uh, environment for bacteria to grow, but you can also uh, have bacteria in potatoes, rice, beans, you know, right, you know, whatever you cook, there can be bacteria in it. So, um, you should always protect your food. That's why if you go to a restaurant, like for, I don't know if yeah, they have this everywhere. Uh, if you've been in Subway, there's a restaurant that's called Subway. I don't know if they have that in other countries. I think they have it in some countries. Um, I tried to see if, if, um, if they were keeping the rules. I asked them, well, one day I went to, I, I asked them how, you know, how do you manage this food? and and I was asking the person who was serving um, because the food was there, you know, the food is there in front of you. And I said, do you have this, do you have some type of um, 
uh, refrigeration underneath that thing? And the lady said, yes, we do have it because we need to have that. In fact, you need to either keep the food warm or you, you keep it you know, an, in temperature like cold so that you know, uh, most of the time, if it's salad, they'll keep, they'll, they'll keep it um, cold. So there's this type of connection. You will see that. And uh, if you go to Subway, for example, you look where there's a salad, you see some uh, the same uh, thing that you see sometimes in your refrigerator. Uh, it looks like a snowy part of that uh, uh, in the corners. That's why they need to keep it you know, um, uh, cold at a certain temperature. And the food that, is, that needs to be uh, kept uh, warm or hot, they're going to have a connection to keep it hot all the whole time. Because if they don't do that, bacteria will grow in it. So it, we need to do the same thing you know, at home, not to leave the food uh, for too long uh, period of time. So that is not food that's supposed to be acidity. So I say if you have a, if the food has a, a pH level of less than um, seven, um, seven, so there should be seven, for example, that's the normal range. Um, and then it is considered acidic. So if it's less than that, you know, now if it's above, it's considered uh, alkaline. So, um, so it's better to have it normal. And I, it depends on how long you, you leave it outside and, you know, and um, the process of preparation. Now, uh, it says most food served in food establishment, especially milk, fish, and meat has a pH in the range of from 4.6 to 7. So that's, uh, see people eat meat and, and fish, they have more, they're more susceptible to, about to get disease or bacteria from, uh, from the food because it's not really, you know, the way it's supposed to, to be. So um, mildly acidic, um, but it can create an environment for the bacteria to grow. So more, the more acidic environment you have, the more the, the bacteria can, can grow. So um, temperature, for example, you need to have uh, 32 degrees to 70 degrees of Fahrenheit, for example. These bacteria, they, they can go, you know, resist certain time of, uh, of heat or cold. So there are bacteria that are in your refrigerator. Your refrigerator can be full of bacteria, full of bacteria. So that's why you need to, to keep a, a very uh, normal temperature uh, so that the bacteria don't grow inside your refrigerator, right? So um, that, you know, that's gonna be uh, depending on the, um, you know, the, the level you have it, the degree you have it. Now, in two hours, for example, like I will read this first, um, you see, yeah. Bacteria need at least four hours to produce numbers large amount enough to cause illness. So the point is not the, the bacteria itself because your body can fight the bacteria because you have an immune system, you have good bacteria, you have uh, you know, bacteria that can even swallow up the, those bacteria, the macrophages, for example. Um, so uh, you, you have the other types of bac you know, bacteria that can also, you know, you even use, use um, <clears throat> some cells, they, they can secrete some liquids or something like that to destroy those, those bacteria. And um, for example, if, if you see a bomb, I'd say, um, how do you call this? Uh, you, you have, um, um, I would not say a bump, but you have um, <clears throat> uh, pulses, you know, a little spot on your skin that has pulses in it. And um, what happened is if you see that, that's gonna be a result of, of a fight. You know, it's, it's a fight between uh, white, white blood, uh, blood cells and bacteria, good bacteria, and also uh, bad, the bad ones. So they fight to protect you. So now the point is, is it will depend on the number of bacteria you, you get into your system right? and, and the condition that, uh, you know, of your immune system. So um, now it says that the bacteria cells can double every 15 to 30 minutes. So if you, know, if you have a food, you leave the food outside, it's not getting, it's not warm, it's not, you're not being 
you stand on the stove, you're not keeping it warm at the normal temperature. So what's going to happen is those ba you know, bacteria, the bacteria that are, that, that, that's in the food will grow, will multiply. And in every 15 minute, 30 minutes, they, they could go double and double and double, multiply, right? So in two hours, one cell, just one, can become 250, all right? So now if you have, you know, with 100, for example, after three hours, you're going to have 6,400, 6,400 cells in, in your food, just starting with one. So in three hours, so if you get to four hours, this is going to double. So you have more bacteria to deal with and your body might not be able to, to go through this. But, you know, it, at, at some point, it will fight. It will fight uh, back, you know, and, and try to protect you. But you, you might go through diarrhea. You might go, to, you know, through fever or something like that. You will not feel comfortable. Uh, people will get infected eating food from restaurants. They will feel sometimes headaches, back, uh, um, diarrhea. They might be vomiting, you know, um, things like that because this is the body's reaction to protect you against the, you know, uh, these things. So temperature, remember I talk about your refrigerator. Temperature should go 40 uh, degrees Fahrenheit uh, to 140 Fahrenheit. So so that's known as the temperature danger. Um, well, I would say above that, it's not below that. So above that, it should go above that because this is a danger zone. So if you have, for example, um, that also that's also good. Uh, uh, con also concern concerning the food. Let's say you put your, the food in the on the stove. Let's say the food is left over. Let's say five, six hours or eight hours. Um, that food already has bacteria in it. Now you have two phases. There's a phase of bacteria multiplication. They're gonna multiply. The second phase is as they multiply, they will release toxins in the food. And the toxins are, uh, they're considered poison for our body. So you have two things to deal with. Now, if the bacteria has not re released toxin, when you warm the food, you can kill them. Right, you can kill them, but to warm that, the temperature should be above 140. Right, it should be above that. So you cannot just warm the food just a little bit, and it's still a little cold, and then that's fine. No, you need to heat the food in such a way that the heat will kill all the bacteria that you have in the food. Now let's hope that they did not get to release toxin because when it has toxin in it from the bacteria. Even if you warm up the food at the normal temperature, the way it's supposed to, the toxin is still going to be there. And the toxin, there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to get to your body. It will cause you to get sick. Right? So keep your you know, temperature to warm up the food above, above uh, uh, 140 degrees. Right? So in oxygen, also, there is um, bacteria that can live in oxygen. Uh, 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 where there's oxygen, there's some bacteria that cannot live in, in this environment. So it will depend on what kind of, you know, uh, bacteria you have. Yeah, moisture and, you know, they, they are also environments that for the bacteria to grow. So, you know, let's avoid you know, things like that. Um, so the key point is keep your food warm. If you're not eating the food, put it in the refrigerator. Now, if you're putting it in the refrigerator, Make sure that the uh, it's so a temperature is normal, so that um, you don't have to uh, you, you don't have to you know have problem. Uh, it you don't have to put the refrigerator very cold, but the colder it is, the better it is because even some bacteria, like I said, can resist the cold. They can stay there, depending on how uh, uh, low it is the temperature is. So the lower it is, the better it is uh, for you know for you to keep your food in you know, good condition so you don't have to, to go through that situation. So you, know, you, you get to a situation where the whole family, the entire family, the entire family got, you know, can get sick from, from you know, food. And it's, it's not, it can take like one or two days, three days for you to recover depending uh, on the situation. Sometimes it can get very serious. Like in the case I explained with that, that little boy who died 
you know so uh in that case i explained also of the the woman that did not wash her fruit properly and she lost her baby that's sad you know well you could just do what you have to do and you know protect yourself from bacteria so may god bless us we'll continue next time uh tomorrow so let's protect ourselves from those bad guys you have some good ones that can help you but you don't need the bad guys to be uh, uh to over you know overpass the uh the ones you have that can protect you so god bless us and we'll see you tomorrow god willing Amen. Um, thank you, Brother Jackson, for the wonderful half nuggets. Now, does anyone have a question for Brother Jackson in regard to the half nugget? Yes. yes. Um, he was talking about the bacteria, but how can we keep our systems high on alkaline to prevent these bacteria? Mm. Yeah, actually, it's a very good point you, you, you're mentioning here. Now, there's, there's a case. If you, and this is how it goes. Um, well, actually, when I talk about bacteria, it's about the bad bacteria because bad type of bacteria, because you, we, you do need bacteria in your body. Uh, because like I said, the, uh, I think yesterday, so bacteria, uh, you have 10 times more bacteria than cells. Those are good bacteria. Yeah, you need to have good bacteria. Now, the bad ones, you know, you don't really need them. Well, actually, there's some of them who are still, for example, there are bacteria that can kill people, and you have them in, in your system. The point is, it, it should not grow too much. You know, it should uh, keep that under control. Now, what do you do to keep your body, you know, alkaline? Well, you need to eat uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables. So the more refined product you eat, the more flour, the more grain you eat, you know, and less fruits and vegetables, the more your body is, you know, is uh, acidic. So if you want to keep this balance, you need to eat more vegetables and more fruits. So like when you eat, make sure that you have enough vegetable in your, you know, in your, uh, your plate. So that's how you could do that. Um, you know, just ba do a balance. Don't eat only, for example, you should not be eating only rice and beans and the, the great part of, of your diet, rice and beans and, you know, a lot of grains and you don't have enough um, uh, vegetable. So, you know, the, um, in the United States, they, they uh, encourage the, the health department and encourage people to, to half of, you, of your food, for example, 50% of what you eat should be uh, uh, raw, you know, I'd say uh, fruits and vegetable and the other 50% would be other, but some people, they go 80 to 80% 80 and 20. That would be, if you, your body is very acidic, if your blood is very acidic, you might need to go to do more vegetables than, than other things and fruits. And, uh, that's, that's how I could go about it. You know, just get, you know, fruits and vegetables enough in your diet. And the more you, of that you eat, the more alkaline your body, your body will be, you know, and also drink water, you know, need enough water. And, you um, yeah, I cannot <laughs> go a little bit, see, we could take this. Some people, they take, um, they take um, uh, chloroph chlorophyll, which is also a good thing, but, um, it, you know, eating fruits and vegetables should be fine for you enough. And in fact, I got to answer your question. Yes, that answered the question. Thank you. Yeah. So another thing I would tell, because if you, if you eat, for example, um, the good bacteria can fight, you know, for you in, in, in your behalf, because that's what they're there for. And uh, if you eat the food that will feed them, that's good. That's a good thing. And one thing that, feed, that feeds them is the uh, fiber. If you eat a lot, you know, enough fiber. That's why eating fruits will help you. Onions, you know, that has all fiber. Whatever has fiber, you take that. That's gonna feed you good bacteria. Okay, brother. Yeah, brother. Thank you. No problem. Amen. Um, we don't really have time to take another 
a testimony and a, and a question. Um, before we hear our message tonight with Brother Danny Barbeck, let us um, sing one stanza on our um, second team song, number 417. And then the next verse you will hear after will be Brother Daniel. Would you be free from your burden of sin? This power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? This wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder walking power in the blood of the lamb. There is power, power. Wonder walking power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. With you, Brother Daniel. Hello, good evening, brethren. Good evening. Uh, brother, did you want me to begin now? Yes, you may start now. Okay. Good evening, brethren. I'm very happy to uh, be here this evening with you and um, and share a topic that is very dear to my heart. Uh, the topic is the topic about doing missionary work and evangelism. The title is a work for each and every one of us. And um, today, with the help of the Lord, since the time is limited, I would like to go straight to the point and share the most important key aspects in regards to doing evangelism and missionary work. Um, and also, especially uh, where we would begin uh, to do missionary work. And so uh, as we begin, let us kneel those that are able and we will have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you this evening, we're so thankful for the blessed opportunity to fellowship, to learn. I'm thankful for the brethren who are gathered together. And Lord, as I share this message, I ask that I will be your tool and that you would speak through me with your Holy Spirit. I also ask that you would open the hearts and the minds of those listening, touch them also with your Holy Spirit. We thank you for all that you've done and you will do in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So I need to be able to share the screen, brother, please, if possible. It says that the host uh, disabled the screen sharing. Okay, great, thank you. And the title of this study is called A Call, A Call to Personal Labor. And uh, I wanna ask us in regards to missionary work and doing labor for the master, who is this missionary work for. Many times we have the concept, especially in church, that the missionary work is to be left to the Bible workers or to the pastors. And so I want us to take a look and see what inspiration tells us. We read from Desire of Ages, page 822. The Savior's commission to the disciples included all the believers. It includes all believers in Christ to the end of time. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow men. So according to these two quotes that we have, my dear brethren, those of us as church members as followers of Christ, we are accountable to do this work, the work of working for the salvation 
of our fellow mankind. And so each and every one of you, you know, if you have, uh, if the Lord has been able to use you, if you have been uh, successful in this work, or maybe some of us, we haven't been as active in this area of our Christian walk as we should be. And um, so if we haven't, that um, there's nothing we can do about the past, but we can redeem the time. And so don't be discouraged with the help of the Lord. Let's see what we can learn today and what we can do to redeem, redeem the time and to live up to, and to live up to the, um, the requirement that God has for us. One thing I do want to share is when I came into, um, when I came into the church, um, I was born into this faith, but I left at younger years and I went into the world. And when I came back to the Lord years later, and I was baptized and came into the church, one brother told me something that was very important in regards to missionary work. He told me like this, once you, uh, and he compared um, a Christian's life to the model that that we have of the earthly sanctuary. So if you can kind of picture in your head the earthly sanctuary, as I describe what this uh, brother shared with me, he said like this, when we come to Christ, we go through, we go through the areas in the earthly sanctuary. When we come to Christ, we accept Jesus as our sacrifice, which is the altar of sacrifice in the courtyard. After we accept Jesus as our sacrifice, we move to the laver, which represents baptism. After we, rep after we receive baptism, we enter into the holy place, which means basically the holy place is represented of the church or the sanctuary. So after baptism, what happens? You become a member. You enter into the body of Christ or the church, the sanctuary. He said, once you enter into the sanctuary... There are three articles of furniture. And he said, you need to make sure, Brother Daniel, that as a newly baptized member, that all articles of furniture in the holy place, in the sanctuary, are active in your life. And he said, when you walk in the sanctuary, you have on the right, you have the table of showbread that represents uh, Jesus' body, which was given for us, and also rep represents bread or bread of life, which is the word of God. And the bread was constantly on the table. And he said, if you want to make sure that you have a successful Christian life after being baptized, you need to make sure that all three articles in the holy place are active in your life. And he compared them to a three-legged stool. So if any of you has a three-legged stool, you can imagine sitting on a stool with three legs. And what would happen if one of the three legs was removed? Obviously, if you're sitting on that stool, you would fall over. And so he said, if one of the articles in the holy place is missing from your Christian experience, you will fall over in your Christian experience. So the first leg is the table of showbread, which represents the bread of life or God's word. We have to continually have God's word in our life to be successful. Um, uh, the second article, which was in the front of the most holy place, was the altar of incense and the altar of incense represents prayers ascending up to god and so that's our prayer life and he said the second thing that you need is you need prayer life you constantly have to have prayer uh, as a christian to be successful in your christian walk and have all those legs of the stool and the third thing he said which most people neglect is the seven branch candlestick which we know uh, the seven branch candlestick was an empty vessel, which we are we are to be the empty vessel, right? And we are to be filled with oil, and the oil is the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit, the purpose that the seven branch candlestick received oil was that so it could be lighted, and so that it could be the light of the world. And he said that is one of the articles or pieces of the furniture that is most commonly left out of a Christian's spiritual walk. And so most people are sitting on a fallen over stool and they've fallen over in their Christian walk because they've eliminated at least one of the, the items working in their, in their personal life that are represented in 
the holy place. So I want to encourage you uh, and remind you about how important this special gospel commission that we have is, is for us in our spiritual walk. Now, um, I want to take a look at what other name does Sister White have for this missionary work. She has a very special name, and she calls it like this. This is from the book 1888 Messages, page 1788. She says, of all sciences, the highest and most essential is the science of soul saving. So here we have Sister White, inspiration, and she calls missionary work the science of soul saving. Now, I want to ask you, when you hear the word science, what comes to mind? What do you think about when you come to what? when you think of the word science. And this is important because she relates or she calls soul-saving missionary work a science. Okay, so I'm going to share the first two things that come to my mind, which are very important. The first thing is study. Um, when you think of science, you think you have to do a lot of studying. And so the same thing needs to be done in order to be a successful missionary. We have to do a lot of studying on the subject itself itself needs to be studied, missionary work, evangelism. Um, that is why Sister White calls it a science. Another thing that comes to mind is, and I want to say this to encourage us, because sometimes maybe we have tried to do evangelism or missionary work, and maybe sometimes it, it fails, and then maybe sometimes we get discouraged be, because it fails, and then we don't try it again. But another thing that comes to mind when I think of science is experimentation. I'm sure many of you remember in probably high school where you had to mix two chemicals together. One of the most common experiments was mixing baking soda and vinegar together. And what happens if you mix too much of one or too little of the other? What ends up happening is it, it ends up creating like a volcano effect and just it ends up kind of uh, exploding everywhere. And um, so the word science denotes experimentation. And so in order to be a successful scientist, a person has to experiment. And so that's what she's saying here by referring to evangelism as science. Um, it, there are times where we, where we are successful and there are times where we fail. But just because we fail, it doesn't mean that we should not keep going. If you were to talk about uh, inventors of electricity or the light bulb, um, there's many statistics on how many times they failed before they were successful. The Bible says in Galatians 6 verse 9, and let us not be weary, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In other words, right when we come to the point of thinking it's time to give up or we feel like we're going to faint, the Bible confirms, it gives a promise, it says we will reap. And so um, Galatians 6, 9, remember that. That's an encouraging verse to me as a pastor when I do missionary work. It's been a blessing to me. I'm sure it would be to you also. Okay, now that we understand that this is a science, where is the first area of this science where we need to start to begin to understand the science better? Where is the first area where we need to start? Let's take a look here. She says here in she says here in the same book, continuing on a little bit, the science of soul saving embraces very much. You need to learn more concerning this science, for you need to exert a molding influence over everyone with whom you have anything to do. But in order to do justice to this work, you must first learn of Christ. Wow. Uh, the center part right there, which is in bold, is very powerful to me. She says that we need to exert a molding influence over everyone with whom we have anything to do. Wow. That means everyone I come into contact with, they need to see something in my life that will influence them in a positive way, in a spiritual way. And she says the only way we can do that is only by first learning of Christ. And I want to ask you today, brothers and sisters, do you want to have molding influence upon everyone with whom you come in contact with? 
Yes, even with people that you just see in the supermarket while you're waiting in line. Uh, maybe if you're a young person while you're in school, in the hallways, God wants you to have an influence upon everyone. But we can only do this through knowing Christ. And yes, even us as members, we need to know Christ better. Now, um, going on, why is it that we need to know Christ better? The Bible tells us in a well-known verse in John chapter 15, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Brothers and sisters, where is the Father at this moment? The Father is in heaven. Jesus is saying, if you want to get to the Father, if you want to if you want to get to heaven, which is where the Father is, if you want to bring someone to heaven, if you want them to find or to have salvation, eternal life, there is only one way to get them there, period. And that is through Jesus. Jesus is the only way to salvation. Um, I think many times we forget this aspect even in evangelism, and even as pastors, I have forgotten this. I have forgotten this sometimes. Let me give you a testimony, um, a short testimony about working with a brother. When I was a young Bible worker, I was working with another pastor, and we had a new soul that we were working with. This was a Seventh-day Adventist man, and um, we were preparing him for baptism. And so we went through all of our doctrines and all of our principles of faith. And when we got done with all of the principles of faith, it was time to ask this man if he understood everything. And then we told him, if you understood everything, you, and you accept it, and you're willing to live it out, you are ready for baptism. And so all the things we had presented to him or what he was able to do, what he was not able to do, so on and so forth. And as we asked him that question, do you understand everything that we've presented to you? Have you accepted it? And are you willing to live by it? Because if so, if you have done that, then you're ready for baptism. And when we asked the man that, he said, you know what? Something is very concerning to me. He said, you know, I almost do not want to be baptized in this church because you have not asked me if I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and if I have a relationship with him. And me and that pastor, we looked at each other and we were just, we were just ashamed. We were just so ashamed. And it was true. We had told him all what he could do and what he couldn't do, and we had completely missed Jesus. And one thing I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, in regards to this Bible verse here, when we do missionary work, our goal should not be, and, and, and I want to repeat this, um, and sometimes people may say, oh, Brother Danny, what do you mean? But our goal should not be to bring a person to the church. That should not be our primary goal, to bring them to the church, to get them to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement. Our goal should not be to get them to believe all the doctrines that we, that we believe. That should not be our primary goal. Are those things good? Is it good if they become a baptized member? Yes. Is it good if they join the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement? Absolutely yes. Is it good if they understand and accept the Sabbath doctrine? Absolutely yes. But all those things, brothers and sisters, without Jesus are worth absolutely nothing. And this is the point that I want to emphasize. And many times um, in Adventism, this is just something that we do in Adventism, not always and not everyone, but sometimes, um, we many times we focus too much on the principles and we forget about Jesus. There is a quote from Spirit of Prophecy where Sister White says that Jesus is, uh, I can't quote it exactly, but she says something, Jesus is the beginning, the middle, and the end. Basically, Jesus, 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 Jesus is everything, and we have to present him 
all the way through. And so I just want that to be uh, first and foremost in our mind when we do missionary work. It is always about revealing Jesus, coming to the church, accepting all the principles, getting baptized. All those things should come naturally after they accept Jesus. Now, um, the next question I have is how often should we be ready to do missionary work? How often should we do it? A lot of times in the church, we have this mentality, we have this understanding that missionary work or being a missionary is something that we kind of turn on or turn off. For instance, let's say it's Sabbath afternoon and we need an afternoon activity so we don't go home and take a nap and waste the Sabbath. So we decide that we will go and pass out, let's say, great controversy or steps to Christ in the neighborhood for two hours after church. Is that a good activity? Absolutely. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy says that we need to pass out um, our, the literature, especially the Spirit of Prophecy, as the leaves of autumn. Now, let's say that I do, I do the passing out of literature once a week, every Sabbath afternoon. Um, four, so that's four times a month I pass out literature. Can I now call myself a missionary? Let's say I don't have time to do any missionary work the rest of the week, but I, I do that passing out of literature four times a month. Let's say I even purchase the books. Can I now call myself a, minute, a missionary? And so my question is, how often do we need to be ready to do missionary work? How often should we be doing missionary work? Um, is missionary work something we do only as we have time? The Bible gives us an answer. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, and the Bible says like this, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so I want to ask you, my brothers and sisters, how often do we need to be ready to be a missionary? As we see here, the Bible is clear, and it tells us to be ready always. Now, um, there is something that has to be happening in my life, spiritually, in order for me to be ready always. Just like um, we read earlier from the Spirit of Prophecy, that in order to understand the sciences of science, science there is something that I first need to understand. There is what is called in college a prerequisite. And the prerequisite to understanding missionary work is to first know Jesus. Now, there is a prerequisite to being ready always, which is mentioned right here. And what is the prerequisite? The prerequisite is, first, the Bible says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In other words, I cannot be ready always to give an answer to every man until the process of sanctification is going on first in my life. And what is the work of sanctification? Well, as you know, the work, the word sanctify uh, has several meanings. One of the first meanings is to set aside for a holy purpose. The word sanctify also means to make holy and or free from what? Free from sin. It means actually to clean or to be cleansed. And so how does God cleanse us or free us from sin. Well, there is uh, several aspects. The Bible says in the book of John that says ye are clean through the word. And so we know that God's word clears, cleans us. But also we know that the one that convicts us of our sin is the Holy Spirit. And so the work of sanctification involves the indwelling of Jesus in our heart through the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean when I say the process of sanctification has to be going on in my life first before I can be ready always? What it means is, as the Holy Spirit convicts us, 
through our conscience with what is right and what is left, saying go to the left or go to the right. It is up to us because everything that we do, God has allowed us to have our free will to either accept the working of the Holy Spirit in our life and to deny self and to give our will to God and to follow him or to follow our own inclination. And if the Holy Spirit has convicted me not to do something and I decide and I know it's wrong. And I, you know, the Holy Spirit says, go to the right. And I say, you know what? I know I should. I know it's the right thing. But you know what? Today, I'm just going to, you know what? Today, I'm not going to do it. And I make the wrong decision. I'm going to listen to the Holy Spirit tomorrow. But today, I'm not going to the right. I'm going to the left. What have I just done, brothers and sisters? I have just cut the process of sanctification in my life temporarily but i have cut it and i have stopped it so at this point am i now ready always if i have stopped this process in my life no without this process continually going on in my life i'm not to be ready always now there is a way to constantly be sanctified to have the process of sanctification working in our lives. And there is a result of the process of sanctification. And we are going to take a look at that and see what happens when the process of sanctification is going on in our life. So the Bible tells us here in John chapter 5, verse 15, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, these verses. This is Jesus speaking, and this is what happens in us if the process of sanctification is going on in our life. Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Now, this is very important. We, we, we know these verses clearly. Jesus is saying he's the vine, or he's like the stock. And we are the branches. Now, the Bible says we need to abide in him and, and he in us. We know how we abide in Jesus. That is through his word, through spiritually ingesting his word, study of his word, and also through prayer, through our prayer life. Now, if that process is happening in an effectual manner through the working of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says we can bring forth Fruit, it doesn't just say fruit, it says much fruit. Now, um, what would happen if the branch, for some reason, became disconnected from the vine? Would the branch still bear fruit? We know the answers. If someone was to cut a branch off of a vine, uh, it would be good for nothing except to, what, throw in the bonfire. And we know that there is no production of fruit from the branch itself. And so the connection is vital. So what would happen if I would disconnect from Christ for one or two days that I'm not bearing fruit? Now, I want us to go to the fruit and see how this verse applies to evangelism. Okay, so if we disconnect ourselves from Christ, even for a day or two, we're not going to bring fruit for fruit. Now, how, why is the fruit so important to evangelism? Okay, so first of all, I'm sure many of you have either fruit trees or you have been to a place that has fruit trees. Let me ask you a question um, about some branches that are even connected to a tree, but they're not bearing fruit. So when you would go to, let's say you had a fruit tree in your backyard, it has, let's say, pomegranates, and you would go to that pomegranate tree, which is the branch if you had 10 branches on that tree which is the branch that you would go to usually the answer always is the branch that has the most fruit the branch that has the biggest fruit why because the fruit are what attract me to the tree do i ever walk to a fruit tree and look at it and spend time under the fruit tree if it has no fruit absolutely not the same goes for the branches. Now, this is important, brothers and sisters. Who are the branches? You are the branches. I am the branches. 
when someone is around us, what would attract them to us? What should attract them to us? It should be fruit that we are bearing because we are connected to the vine, which is Jesus. Now, what are those fruits? Remember, if we have the process of sanctification working in our heart through Jesus Christ indwelling in us through the Holy Spirit, what are the fruits that we will be bearing? You already know this. The fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. You see, as we bear fruit and the fruit of the Spirit, people will be attracted to us because of the fruit that we're bearing. And so if we are not in Christ and him in us through the process of sanctification, there is nothing attractive uh, about us. And the Bible says in regards to this missionary work, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. And so if we're unsuccessful, brothers and sisters, we have to ask ourselves that question again. Are we in Jesus? If we are in Jesus and he is in us, we should be bearing fruit. Verse 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Yes, we call ourselves disciples, but many times we are self-proclaimed disciples. The true sign of being a disciple is the bearing of fruit, which we know is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I want us to go even a little further in regards to this. The Bible says in John 15, verse 9, As the Father hath loved me, so I loved you, and continue ye in my love. Back to the fruit of the Spirit. What is the first and most important fruit of the Spirit? Yes, we already know this. It is love. You see, brothers and sisters, the love of Jesus, as it affects me, as it has touched me, and affects me is able to be should be able to be shined out to others and that is what will be attractive to them jesus says in verse 10 if ye love me keep my commandments ye shall abide in my love even as i have kept my father's commandments and abide in love and so we know that the commandments are nothing more than a demonstration of God's love for us, or our love for him, and our love for humanity. The most important fruit, brothers and sisters, that we have to be bearing is love, and we need to have that love for everyone. Verse 11 says, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is a commandment, brothers and sisters. This is a command from Jesus that we have love one for another. If we don't have this love, we're not bearing fruit. If we're not bearing fruit, we will not be successful in missionary work. Um, and the Bible says, going on further, there is a purpose for having this love. There is a purpose for bearing this fruit. Jesus doesn't just say bear fruit just to bear fruit. Uh, as I said earlier, especially as Seventh-day Adventists, the Seventh-day Adventist reformers, if we have a fruit tree in our backyard, do we just have it to have it with fruit hanging from it? Or what do we do with it? We have a purpose for it. For it. Yes, we have a purpose for, for those fruit trees, and that's to eat the fruit. Now, what is the purpose for us bearing fruit. Why does Jesus want us to bear fruit? Uh, the fruit of the Spirit. And so the Bible says here, verse 16, ye have not chosen me, this is all in the same context, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Okay, let's take a look at this verse six, verse, in, uh, verse 16. And let's talk about the fruit that are mentioned here and the fruit that were mentioned up above in verse two. Now, are these the same types of fruit? In verse two, Jesus said he wants us to what? To bear fruit. That means we would bear fruit. And we know those to be the fruit of the Spirit. Now, in verse 16, 
Jesus is saying that because we bear fruit, okay, he wants us to go and bring fruit. So if we would go and bring fruit, this would not be the same fruit that's being talked about. This is not of the fruit of the Spirit. And so we know that the fruit that's being talked about here is as we bear the fruit of the Spirit, we are able to go and people, souls that are attracted to the fruit that we bear, they will come and we will be able to bring them to the feet of Jesus. This is the fruit that we are to go and to bring, and that is souls. And so, yes, Jesus has a purpose for us to bear fruit, uh, especially the fruit of love, which is his character, because his character is a character of love. And that is to go and bring forth fruit or souls, those fruit that should remain. And the Bible promises us, it says that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you in regards to evangelism brothers and sisters we can ask we have a promise that god will bless us and he concludes here in verse 17 saying these things i command ye that ye love one another in order to bear fruit and to go and bring fruit we need to have the fruit of the spirit which is the fruit of love even for those that we don't get along along with just like Jesus did as he gave us the example and died for us while we were still in sin. Now, as we continue to study, I want us to take a look at, and I want us to understand what is the best method to use in the work of evangelism. So as we have the fruit of love and we're going now to look for other fruit to bring to Jesus, which is the the fruit of souls, what is the best, best method that we are to use? And so let's take a look here. From Ministry of Healing, page 143, she says like this, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. I want us to pay attention to this quote very, very um, closely. This is a very important quote. If I could say that there would be one quote from the spirit of prophecy that would sum up evangelism, I would say this would be the quote. The first thing that we see here clear is that my method is not the one that will work. Your method is not the one that will work. Uh, your pastor's method, your Bible worker's method, the GC conference president's method is not the method that will work. The one that will work alone and give true success is the method of Christ, period. And we need to learn and implement his method. We need to look here now at the order of the steps that are taken in order to bring people to Jesus. We also need to look at the order of the steps that we see before um, something spiritual is introduced to people. Many times when we do evangelism or missionary work, we think the first thing that we have to do is we have to share with them about the Sabbath. Uh, yes, that is very good. The Sabbath is very good. But that is not necessarily the first thing that we have to share. And I have a quote from Sister White that says that. I'm not able to share it at this time. But what was the first thing that Christ did first? The first thing that he did in the steps of evangelism, number one, is he mingled with people. In other words, brothers and sisters, we have to be with people. Yes, with people that we need to witness to, people that Jesus would be with. Jesus mingled with everyone, the rich, the poor, uh, those were that were considered holy, those that were considered outcasts, those that were considered sinners, prostitutes, the mentally ill, uh, the wealthy. Jesus mingled with everyone. He was invited to feasts. He would go to them and he would mingle with people. That's first and foremost. That's number step number one. The second step is that he desired their good. He had a genuine love for the people because he was pr producing the fruit of the spirit because he was constantly abiding in his father. 
And so he gave us an example of abiding in, 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 in God and God abiding in him while he was here on earth. And he had that genuine love for people. So because he, he ministered that, he produced that fruit of the spirit of love, he had a genuine desire for their good. When we mingle with people, I don't care who it is, homeless, uh, anyone, do we have a desire for their good? That's step number two. Number three was he showed sympathy for them. When we hear their problems, their trials, do we judge them right away? Do we think, oh, wow, we're a reformer, we're vegetarian, we're vegan, and uh, you know we keep the Sabbath, and these people, they have jewelry, they have tattoos, they have habits. These people, they're in a terrible condition. Is that how we feel, or do we have sympathy? Jesus had sympathy. Remember, he was successful, and we want to be successful in this work, so we have to follow his steps. Step number four was he then ministered to their needs, and when this is speaking about needs, I would say about 75% of the time, the immediate needs that people have are physical or emotional needs. Those are the needs that need to be addressed first um, before we can directly address their spiritual need. We know that everyone has a spiritual need. As a matter of fact, we have spiritual needs. But most people, many people, they have an either emotional need or a physical need. And we're going to take a look shortly at some of the examples that Jesus gave us uh, to follow of him ministering to people's needs. So this is step four after he showed his sympathy for them because he had a genuine love for them because he mingled with people. Step number four, he ministered their needs. He, he saw a need and he plugged it. He saw a need and he filled it. Now, step number five was something that happened automatically. This was not something that he had to put effort to, to do extra. After he finished step number four, automatically, step number five, which is winning their confidence, it just came naturally. People had confidence in Jesus. They trusted him. They believed him. Why? Because they saw that genuine fruit of the spirit of love through his desire and his um, showing of sympathy and his ministering to their needs. That was step number five. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. The time when Jesus addressed them spiritually was not in the beginning. It wasn't the first step. It was the last step. It was step number six. And after he won their confidence, then he told them, follow me. Okay, and that's a spiritual, that's where he spiritually addressed them because to follow Jesus means to follow him in everything, including living a life of sanctification and free from sin. And so that's when he asked them after he won their confidence to follow him and to learn how to be free from sin. It wasn't until first he won their confidence. And I can't put enough emphasis on this quote. This quote, just like I said, it sums up, it sums up um, evangelism. Let's just, let's just take a look at the woman, the woman caught in adultery. Um, the first thing that Christ knew about her is that she had committed adultery, that she had many husbands and she was even caught in the act. And um, long story short, immediately Jesus could have told her, go and sin no more, woman. Shame on you. But that's not what he did. The first thing he did was um, he desired her good. He showed a sympathy for her. He ministered to her need. What was her need at the moment when they were trying to stone her? Her need was the saving of her life. And so Jesus uh, because of his sympathy and love he had in his heart, he wrote, we all know he wrote in the sand, all her accusers departed. And then he said, woman, where are your accusers? And at that time, he won her confidence. Her heart was broken. And she had a love for Jesus. And uh, she said, Lord, they have fled. And at that moment, after he won her confidence, then he said, go and sin no more. That was the follow me, okay, to be like him without sin, all right? So we can see clearly from Christ's example, he, he followed this. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, I just broke this down for you guys so that you can have it clearly here, step one through six. Like I said, let's not, let's not start backwards. Let's not tell people to come follow us first in our lifestyle first, and then we mingle, then we mingle with them. Then we desire their good. No, let's, let's start with one first. 
working down to six, okay? This is not my method. This is the method of Christ. Now, um, and I want to tell you something else. I, we don't have much time, but just real quickly, this is uh, this uh, step one through five. What this is called is this is called step one through five is called preparing the soil. Okay. Jesus used the example of uh, gardening to illustrate missionary work when he had the sower of the seed, right? The sower and the seed, which were the seeds that were um, that got planted and bear, bore fruit, the seeds that were planted in the good ground. So if you were a gardener, uh, how, would you, how would you plant a crop? If you wanted to plant tomatoes, would you just throw your seed on the hard ground and just pray and hope that it, you know, it, it, it plants itself? No, what would you have to do before you throw your seed? First thing you have to do is put fertilizer, you have to dig up the soil, you have to pull up the weeds, and then you would plant your seeds. So, so the first part before you plant your seeds is called prepare the soil. So this steps one through five are called preparing the soil. This is an important step, okay? You don't plant the seed until step six, okay? Step six is plant the seed. That is the second phase in evangelism that is called planting the seed. The first, the first step in evangelism is prepare the soil. That's point one through five in Christ's method. And then the second step in evangelism is plant the seed, which is, we know, the gospel, the word of God, or inviting them to church. And that is step number two. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Once again, this is Christ's method. Um, we are coming to a close here. Just a minute. Okay, let me check my slides. Okay, it says here, um, the world needs today what is revealed, what, what it needed 1900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded, and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual can be accomplished. I want to point this out once again. Why is it so important that we use Christ's method as we read in Ministry of Healing, page 143? Christ's method and his method alone. The reason we have to use his method, brothers and sisters, is because the world needs a revelation of Christ. He is the one that has to be revealed. And the only way to reveal Christ is through his method. If I'm doing my own method, things that I think work, and I end up finding out they don't work, why is it they don't work? Because people, they don't need a revelation of Brother Danny. I'm a human being. Humans don't need a revelation of humans. They already know humans. We know humans. We know that we're selfish. We know that we're pride, proud. We know that we, um, we have ugly characters. The world knows humanity. Humanity knows humanity, but the world does not know Jesus. So brothers and sisters, we need to know him first personally. We need to use his method, and then we can reveal Christ to the world which is exactly what they need, okay? As we go on, she says here in Ministry of Healing, page 143, I recommend uh, Ministry of Healing, page 143. The whole page is wonderful. It says like this, there is need of coming close to the people by personal effort. Pay attention to this sentence in her. She says, you, we can come close to people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God. This work will not, cannot be without fruit. Uh, this is a, probably the second most um, important quote in regards to evangelism. Here she puts, she puts all the weight of value on coming close to people by personal effort, not by preaching, not by Bible studies. Are Bible studies important? Absolutely. Are sermons important? Absolutely. But the, the, the weight of power in evangelism 
is in coming close to people. How can we come close to people? There are so many ways. Um, this is called preparing the soil. One of the most important ways I would recommend that we would come close to people is by um, befriending them. And one of the best ways that always works is usually through food. Most people won't refuse a meal. I would recommend to you, if you want to witness, you want to do evangelism with someone, invite them for a meal to your home. Take them out to a, to a restaurant. Uh, make them something nice. Make them some nice cookies or some bread. Uh, this is one of the best ways to um, come close to people. And it takes personal effort. Okay, it's easy to it's easy to preach a sermon. It's easy to give a Bible study, but to invite someone to your home, to spend a few hours with them, to have a meal with them, to make a nice meal with them, it takes more time. It takes effort. Okay, and she says this is where the success is. She says this work will not be without fruit. Okay, I want to give some examples here uh, in John chapter two, three, uh, four, and five on how Jesus met social needs. We know the first social need, I'm sorry, how he met the people's needs. The first need that he met was a social need, need at the wedding feast of Cana. Um, we remember the host ran out of the grape juice. Jesus provided the grape juice. So he did many things there. He won the confidence of the host because the host, can you imagine how embarrassed they were? And he also won the confidence of those attending. And um then he was, I'm sure, able to share the gospel seed. Uh, we have Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Jesus went straight to the point with Nicodemus. There are some cases uh, where that may be the need, and that was a spiritual need that Nicodemus had. We also have the woman at the well. She had an emotional need. Uh, you know, people looked down on her, and they treated her terribly because she had six husbands. And Jesus... Um, filled the emotional void that he had by, by presenting to her the water of life. In John chapter 5, we meet where Jesus healed people and he fed people, and we see that he addressed their physical needs. Very important aspects to remember when we're doing evangelism. Now, um, this slide here is also very, very clear to the point, Testimonies Volume 9, tells us how we can win people's hearts or prepare the soil, right? What is the soil that we are to prepare in a person? It is their heart, okay? She says here, by visiting the people, talking, praying, sympathizing, you will win hearts. This is the highest missionary work that you can do, period. Wow. There's no sermonizing here. There's no preaching. Is, is preaching good? Absolutely. Is sermon's good? Absolutely. But this is what she says needs to be done to win people's hearts. Visiting, talking, praying, sympathizing. Just real quickly, we're about to close. Um, there was a lady, um, some of you have heard my testimony. Uh, if you haven't, um, the Lord delivered me from a, a long uh, time worth of addiction. And um, when I was living in the life of addiction, there was a lady who, um, she was the mother of a friend of mine and she was like my second mom and she was always there for me. She would always let me come and uh, eat at her home, um, spend the night there if I needed, even though I was a crystal meth addict. And praise the Lord, he has delivered me from that. It's been almost nine years now. Um, and so this lady, after I came back to the Lord and became a Bible worker, she was one of the first persons that I wanted to do Bible studies with. And so I went to her home and I went to their home for the purpose of uh, trying to ask her to do a Bible study. And so when I got there, um, I was just ready to ask her, uh, let's just say her name was um, Cynthia. And I said, Cynthia, you know, I, I was just thinking in my mind that I was going to say, Cynthia, uh, can I, can I give you a Bible study? But when I got there, she was so angry and upset about things that were going on in her life. She was just talking and talking and talking and talking. And I couldn't butt in and she kept talking and pretty soon it was half an hour and then one hour and then an hour and a half. And then you know, I was about ready to give up. And I told the Lord, you know what, I'm just going to give up. I'm trying to give her a Bible study. I can't even ask her. She's just talking and talking. And after an hour and a half, it was almost two hours. And I was just about ready to just, you know, go home. And finally, after two hours, she had got out everything she was trying to get out. She got it out of her system. And once she got it out of her system, um, she just kind of wound down and she calmed down. And I said, Cynthia, I said, do you know what? The Holy Spirit inspired me at this time. I said, Cynthia, do you know what? 
I also go through problems, struggles, and trials in my life. And do you know what? I can tell you a secret of how I'm able to deal with them because at times it's like I cannot bear them. And I told her, I'm able to open the Bible and read a few words and find such encouragement and peace. And it just takes all my problems away. And she was just listening to me. And I said, Cynthia, would you be willing to let me come to your home sometime and to share God's word with you to where you could use it and it could be a blessing in these hard times? And she said, I would just love that. And you know what? I started Bible studies with her and I gave her Bible studies for about a year and a half after that. And um, she learned everything, the Sabbath, the state of the dead. Um, she never ended up coming to the church, but um, she always kept those in her heart. And um, uh, just to make a long story short, uh, right now, she is literally on her deathbed in the ICU in the hospital. She has sepsis and some other problems. And right after I'm done with the study, I'm going to visit her and I'm going to uh, prepare her um, to ask the Lord for forgiveness and um, to come into her heart uh, because it's very possible that she will, she will pass away. And, and it's a beautiful work that I'm able to do tonight, brothers and sisters. And the only way that I'm able to do that is because I listen to her. I sympathize with her in that beginning, that two hours I was about to give up and I sympathized. And later when I started doing these studies and I understood the importance of this sympathizing, um, that's what she needed first. If I would have asked her for a Bible study before she was able to open all that and, and release all that information, I would have lost that contact. Um, so this is such an important thing, brothers and sisters. And today I'm able to go visit this lady and prepare her um, to, to go to sleep and to be able to sleep in Jesus because of using this method, uh, which I didn't understand at that time. One last quote, and we'll quit. We'll be done for tonight. It says like this in 9T189, if we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tenderhearted and pitiful, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. Brothers and sisters, if there's one that I can leave you with, the most important thing when it comes to evangelism is Jesus and him crucified. If we can understand this for ourselves, if we can share this with others and his love, which is his character, first and foremost, above anything, before anything else, before our doctrines or uh, even having a Bible study, the spirit of prophecy in the Bible guarantees that we will be successful not because of any of our own virtues, but because we're using Christ and his method. And so it's my wish and prayer, brothers and sisters, that um, if we've been active, that with God's help, maybe some things you learned here tonight, we can be more active. If we haven't been active, that we would um, ask the Lord to help us to redeem the time. And uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to share. And uh, I've been blessed. I hope you've been blessed. And um, Maybe we have a few minutes. I don't know, brother. Do we have uh, maybe a couple of minutes if someone has a question or two? There are some questions here in the chat, but I just saw them. Now I wasn't able to see them while I was doing the study. Okay, I think the brother already left and he said I can go up to five minutes before 10. So yeah. then I am done now. All right. Thank you very much, Brother, Brother Balbach. Yes. We appreciate the message and we think it's very clear. But now, if anyone has a question, you can you can. Okay. Yes. Good night. Good night, Brother Daniel. Hello. Hello. Greetings. Yeah, good night. My name is Holly. Brother Holly. Um, thank God for the wonderful message. Thank you for the presentation. It was a wonderful message. Um, the question, though, that um, as you mentioned in our preparation, yes, right, you know, yeah. preparation process. Okay, is is there a time a timeline attached to it? Okay, now are you okay? Now are you saying in preparing the soul before we share the actual yeah. message or the word? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, well, the methods that you give us, right? The methods that right. you just mentioned. Before right. uh, 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 the method that Christ used before, he said, "Follow me." Yes, should yes. Before he said, "Follow me." Yes. Good question. Good question. Okay. Should there be so, a timeline attached to that question? Yes. Um, that so, 
Yes. Yeah, so, so to be honest, um, there is no timeline because every individual person is different. Every situation is unique. Um, so what I would suggest to do is um, what we want to do is we want to use Christ's method. We want to prepare the soil, right, by ministering to people's needs, winning their confidence. And while we're doing that, what we can do is we can gently test the soil and see if it's ready. And we do that by sharing a, uh, sharing a verse here or there or, or casually bringing up a spiritual topic as we are impressed by the Holy Spirit. And we need to be, we need to be praying always asking for guidance of the Holy Spirit, and he will give us direction as to when that soul is ready for the, the next step in, in the phase of evangelism, which is planting the seed. And so, um, you know, some people, it may be a day, some people, it may be months. Um, I, I was dealing with an atheist person, and um, it took um, several months before I could plant the seed. Other people, in the supermarket, you may meet someone in the line and you may just have a friendly conversation with them. And then maybe right before you're about to depart, you know, you're impressed by the Holy Spirit to ask them if they know Jesus or you find out they're a Christian and you can share a Bible verse. So it, it depends. And, and we can't just say there's just like one specific timeline for everyone because everyone in every situation is unique, but that's a good question. And we need to be connected to the Lord and, and through prayer, and listening for the guidance of the Holy Spirit um, to give us um, advice on each individual situation. Thank you. And um, so back up the question, um, should we be using our own personal observation or allow, um, allow the Spirit to do the observation for us? Well, both. both. Um, the Lord has given, you know, the Lord has blessed us with... with, um, with um, insights, you know, uh, and we do have natural instincts that the Lord has blessed us and we should use them. Um, but we shouldn't, we should be careful not to come to certain conclusions. And so it's a combination, but we have to, we have to ask guidance for the Holy Spirit. Let me just give you an example. Um, I have a cousin who was raised in the faith and she, uh, is not a Sabbath keeper. She, she doesn't really go to church now, but there happened to be several, uh, funerals in my family recently. And so my cousin was at the funerals and during the funeral service, uh, even though she was away from church and she wasn't spiritual, and I even think she questioned God, um, I would see her and she would be singing the hymns from the hymnal during the funeral service. Uh, she remembered them. She knew how to sing them and she was crying. So I could tell, uh, of course she was crying because of sadness, but also I could tell the Holy Spirit was working on her. So what happened is, is I, um, I was impressed to reach out to her. And what I did is um, I, I hadn't met with her, to be honest, in about 10, 15 years outside of like the funerals or family functions. And this time I asked to meet with her on a personal basis. And so I was impressed to start Bible studies with her. And when I met with her, I, we went out to get like a juice somewhere and we talked for like maybe um, an hour. And then when we left, I asked her if I could study the Bible with her. And um, it was too soon. It was too soon as she was closed. And to this day, I haven't been able to work with her. And so I made a mistake by not asking for more guidance from, from the Holy Spirit because I should have spent more time in winning her confidence. I should have visited with her uh, three, four, or five times, whatever it took. Um, so sometimes we can rely on our own instincts and we can make wrong conclusions. And, and sad to say, I, I, I made a mistake that time. Okay, brother, thank you. Um, sure. That is clear because um, we know that every case is a different case. So yes. um, we need to ask God for the guidance and, um, yes. and make sure we keep praying. And we know that as Christ mentioned in, um, in Matthew that, um, if they rejected us, because we know that, um, how will we know, how could we know as a question, or how could we know if there's, the re if there's a rejection? How could we know if it's a rejection or if we should, yeah. Um, well, I mean, um, 
the, the rejection, it's, it's pretty clear to know. Uh, rejection, you know, rejection doesn't mean that it's a permanent rejection, but sometimes there's temporary rejections. So like in the case of this cousin, um, every time that I would make a, uh, an appeal to meet with her, she would make an excuse until finally it just kind of died out. Um, so that that's a plain rejection. Um, um, as I said, I made a mistake, and that's possibly why the rejection. More than likely, that's why it happened. Because if I would have, if she wouldn't have felt pressure to study the Bible from me, she probably would have been open to meet with me again and again. Um, but you know, when you when you try to to reach out to someone um, several times and they they're closed and then we can leave them, we can leave them alone and go somewhere else. But that's, that doesn't mean like a rejection, like the doors closed. So, um, you know, I stay friendly with that cousin and, and at the right time, Lord willing, there will be another opportunity. Okay, but uh, I don't want to take up much more time because I know you have a long day. Sure. But we, can, we can get connected and, and, and do more um, reasoning together about various topics. Well, thank you very much, brother. Absolutely, brother. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your questions. Okay, and if nobody else has any questions, um, I don't know who else is on here. Maybe we should close with a prayer. Yes, but so uh, I, I don't know who has the um, who who's running the program. But I'll hand yeah. it over to you. Yeah, if there's no more question, we can end with it, for brother, brother Daniel. Okay, wonderful. Uh, brother, do you have, is this Brother Ricardo? No, this is Brother Kevins. Oh, Brother Kevins. Hi, Brother Kevins. I I was, uh, I met you online in the last presentation I did. Yes, for the missionary um, department. Yes, yes, blessings, brother. Yes, brother. Uh, if you don't mind, you can you can choose someone who would like to pray to close. Okay, brother Jackson, can you pray for us, please? Who's that, brother Kevin? Uh, Kevin's, was that me? Yes, can you please do the last prayer for us? Okay, sure, no problem. All right, let's pray. Lord in heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your blessing, for bringing us your word. Thank you for showing us the method that should be used, the method that Christ left for us. Help us to follow in his steps, to follow the, uh, the path that he has left for us so that we may serve first to see the good of, of others and help them sympathize with them. And at the end, we can ask them to, to follow and to, to present to them the necessity for them to have a relationship with you and help us because it, we may be doing uh, many things, but, but um, the method that Christ has established, and we've seen how Christ was very successful in the work that he came to do in a very short time. A lot of people um, got to know about the, the message and, and some who, who did not decide in his time, a lot of them, uh, decided later on because he sowed the seed and those seed brought, brought fruit in the life of those people. Help us mm -hmm. and also give us your Holy Spirit so that we may know, uh, you know how to approach every single person as they may be different. And this way we may be successful in our work. Bless Father Daniel and his uh, ministry. May you guide him and also his family. And also whatever he does, you may help so that they always be for your honor and your glory. We ask you for the rest of the program that's continuing tomorrow and till this week, we get to this end, to the end of the program. May it be a blessing for each and every one of us. Bless tonight for us. We pray, ask you all these things in the name and merits of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, brethren, God bless. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful night. See you tomorrow. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.